After a Quidditch practice session, Harry's scar hurts again, and this time he talks with Ron about it. He's starting to figure out what mood Voldemort is in each time it burns. This time it's because it's angry. When it hurt in Umbridge's office, it was because he was pleased about something. And the night before they came back to Hogwarts, he was furious. Harry also realizes that Voldemort's anger stems from the fact that something he wants done is not getting done fast enough. And he remembers what Sirius said back at Grimmauld Place about a weapon Voldemort was after. He deduces that Voldemort is probably angry because his attempts to retrieve said weapon have failed. This connection Harry has with Voldemort, as well as his theorizing on what and where this weapon could be, are things I feel the movie could have focused on just a little bit more. I guess the filmmakers felt that this mystery wasn't really central to the story right now, and that they didn't need to go too in-depth with the connection thing yet. Which, fair enough, I guess. But I still kind of wish they had done a bit more. The connection, especially, is extremely important, both in this book as well as Deathly Hallows. That night, after falling asleep and dreaming of the Department of Mysteries corridor again, Harry is woken up by Dobby, who is there to return a now-healed Hedwig to him, and who has apparently been taking all the hats Hermione has been weaving out. In the book, it's him who tells Harry about the Room of Requirement when Harry asks him if he knows anywhere they can practice defense against the Dark Arts, and explains how it works. Harry remembers the hint Dumbledore dropped about it at the Yule Ball as well. In the movie, the Room of Requirement is accidentally discovered by Neville as he walks past it while wishing for a place they could learn defense against the Dark Arts. I think this is a good way of simplifying things, and it does make sense with how the room is supposed to work. While I think this change works, however, it does result in Dobby yet again being cut from the movie. Much like the last movie, cutting Dobby on its own does seem like a good decision to simplify things, However, these cuts will start to add up by the time we get to Deathly Hallows. Dobby being cut also means it's Hermione who explains how the Room of Requirement works in the movie, because she always seems to be the one giving exposition. If anyone, I feel like Fred and George would be the most likely students to know about the Room of Requirement. I suppose it still works with Hermione, though. And I love this line they gave Harry. It's like Hogwarts wants us to fight back. So Dumbledore's army is formed. The book actually shows them coming up with that name. Angelina suggests calling themselves the Anti-Umbridge League, while Fred suggests the Ministry of Magic Are Morons group. Cho then suggests the Defense Association, or DA for short, and Ginny agrees with DA but says it should stand for Dumbledore's army instead, seeing as that's what the Ministry fears. Much like Umbridge abusing her power, the DA meetings are shown in a montage in the movie, condensing several things from the book into a movie time frame. To be fair though, after the first meeting, the book does also kind of skip several weeks ahead, briefly touching on the details of the meetings that happened in the meantime, and showing that Umbridge's lessons have become more bearable knowing that they're fighting back against her under her nose. I do like the way the movie shows this by intercutting between Harry teaching the DA students and Umbridge's useless classes and trying to sniff out the rebels. There'll be no need to talk, only to think some more like it. We see her forming the Inquisitorial Squad made up of eager Slytherins. This doesn't happen until later in the book. And we also see that she's questioning students in her office, presumably using Veritas Serum, which is taken from a later scene in the book where she questions Harry in this manner. In both versions, it is really cool to see Harry teaching. He's actually pretty good at it. Every great wizard in history has started out as nothing more than what we are now, students. If they can do it, why not us? There are several cool moments in this montage, like Neville successfully disarming Parvati and seeing just how powerful Ginny's reductor curse is. At the very least, the movies do get across well how strong Ginny's magic is. If only they could have kept her personality intact. Then there's this cute moment between Harry and Cho, where he accidentally distracts her, causing her to drop a levitating Nigel. Oh, speaking of which, he's teaching them Levicorpus? He's not supposed to know that spell yet. He learns it next year from the Half-Blood Prince's textbook. Oh well, back to Harry and Cho. There is a similar moment in the book where he distracts her and she accidentally sets her friend Marietta's sleeve on fire. According to her, Marietta didn't want to be there as her mom works at the ministry and warned her not to get on the wrong side of Umbridge. Cho also says that her own parents didn't want her to get on Umbridge's bad side either, but she's determined to fight back against Voldemort after what happened to Cedric. I kind of wish we saw a bit more of this fiery side of her in the movie. 
Overall, I think this part is done very well in the movie. I do have a couple problems, though. The first one is fairly minor. It's that Filt and the Inquisitorial Squad seem to know about the group and where they're hiding, and make several attempts to get in, but can't because it's the room of requirement. I kind of like the feeling in the book that they were doing something under Umbridge's nose that she had no knowledge of. It also raises the question of why she didn't break in sooner if Filch already knew where they were. I do like this moment where Fred and George prank Filch with a box of sweets, though. That obviously doesn't happen in the book, but they do prank Zachariah Smith in the lessons by disarming him behind his back. So like I said, that's a minor gripe. Here's a major problem I have, though. Don't worry, I'll go easy on <sighs> Why do the movies do this to Ron? It makes no sense. Ron knows how good Hermione is. There's no way he would underestimate her like this. It just makes Ron seem like a sexist and like he doesn't respect her, which is absolutely not the case. Hell, in the book, he's delighted that he even disarmed her once because he knows how much better she is than him. But yeah, that's my biggest problem here, and it's really, again, a symptom of a greater problem with the movie series as a whole, which is that of the three main characters, Ron is clearly the bottom priority for the filmmakers. Like I said before, though, as a whole, this series of scenes is really well done. There is something in the book that the movie didn't show, and this is after a time jump of a couple weeks. Hermione develops a method of communicating the time of the next meeting, enchanted galleons that change the numbers on them to reflect the meeting time and turn hot when they change so their owner can feel them. Harry is reminded of the Death Eater's scars, and Hermione admits that's where she got the idea. She just decided to use bits of metal rather than burning it into their members' skin. The next big event we see in the book is Gryffindor's Quidditch match against Slytherin. Quidditch, as I've mentioned, was understandably cut from this movie altogether. Before the match, we see that McGonagall and Snape are both blatantly biased and doing whatever they can to help their team win, and we also learn that Crabbe and Goyle are the new beaters for Slytherin since the last two left. Gryffindor, of course, wins the match, but sadly, Ron doesn't perform very well, letting in several goals. It doesn't help that the Slytherins in the stands are singing their new song, Weasley is Our King, to wind him up. Though Lee Jordan does his best to drown out the song with his commentary. After the match, however, things quickly go downhill. Malfoy, furious at having lost, starts mercilessly insulting Ron and his family, calling his mother fat and ugly, and his father a useless loser. Ron has already walked off in shame at this point, but Fred and George here and have to be held back by the three chasers and Harry. However, Malfoy then insults Harry's mother, causing him to let go of George, and the two of them start beating Malfoy to a pulp. Harry and George get in trouble for this, of course, and a furious McGonagall prepares to punish them, but then... Ahem, ahem, educational decree number 25. Not another one. Well, yes. As a matter of fact, Minerva, it was you who made me see that we needed a further amendment. You remember how you overrode me when I was unwilling to allow the Gryffindor Quidditch team to reform? How you took the case to Dumbledore, who insisted that the team be allowed to play? Well, now, I couldn't have that. I contacted the minister at once, and he quite agreed with me that the High Inquisitor has to have the power to strip pupils of privileges, or she, that is to say, <laughs> I, would have less authority than common teachers. So Umbridge uses this new power to ban Harry and George from the team, and Fred as well, since she believes he would have beat Malfoy up too had the chasers not been holding him back. God, there are so many words I want to use to describe her right now, but I'm trying to keep these videos relatively child-friendly. Despite having won the match, the Gryffindors are pretty depressed in their common room that night, especially Ron, who blames himself for being so bad at Quidditch. Hermione, however, tells the two of them something that cheers them up. Hagrid's back. Now, in the movie, this happens later. Hagrid doesn't return until after Christmas break. Also in the movie, Hagrid is being questioned by Umbridge when the trio arrive, and they don't go in until she's left. Whereas in the book, she arrives after he's told them his story, and they have to hide from her. So Hagrid tells the trio about his mission to meet with the giants and try to win them over to their side. In the movie, he just briefly mentions the essentials, that he was trying to get the giants to join their cause, but unfortunately so are the Death Eaters, so he's not certain they will. In the book, he tells them the whole story. 
He and Madame Maxime set out after Dumbledore gave them the mission. It took them about a month to get there, as they couldn't use magic for fear of being arrested, and they had to throw off the Ministry Wizard tailing them. They also couldn't use magic near the Giants, given the Giants' dislike for wizards. When they found the Giants, they found that they ranged from 20 to 25 feet, and there were only about 70 or 80 of them. According to Hagrid, many of them were killed by wizards, but for the most part they killed each other after being driven into hiding and forced to live together for so long. So the next morning, Hagrid and Madame Maxime approached the Gurg, or the Chief, whose name was Karkus, spelled K-A-R-K-U-S, and gave him a gift of everlasting fire. Apparently giants do like magic, just not when it's used against them, and said it was a present from Albus Dumbledore. A couple of the other giants were able to translate for Karkus, who didn't speak English. Wanting to take it slow, they didn't talk to Carcass just yet. Instead, they promised another gift to Moro and came back that day with a goblin-made battle helmet for him. Then they talked. It seemed to go over well. Carcass had heard of Dumbledore and his campaigns arguing against the killing of giants. He seemed interested in what Dumbledore was promising. Unfortunately, that night, there was a power struggle and one of the other giants, named Golgamath, killed Carcass and took over as the Gurg. God, that word is so funny. This was obviously bad, as they had been making headway with Carcass, and now they would have to win over a whole new giant from scratch. Predictably, this didn't go well, and when they arrived the next morning with a new gift for Golgamath, two of the giants lifted him up by the feet. He only escaped thanks to Madame Maxime hitting them in the eyes with spells. Unfortunately, now they had used magic on the giants, there was very little chance of winning them over anymore. To make matters worse, a couple of Death Eaters showed up to convince the giants to join Voldemort, and their offers seemed to go over much better with Golgamath. One of the Death Eaters Hagrid recognized as McNair, the executioner sent to kill Buckbeak, so given that he likes killing as much as Golgamath, the two seemed to get along, and Golgamath was ultimately convinced to join Voldemort. Hagrid and Maxime did manage to make contact with some of the giants who hadn't wanted Golgamath as the Gurg, who were very easy to recognize as they were the most beaten up, and at one point they seemed to have about six or seven of them convinced. But then Golgamath's group raided the caves they were hiding in, and suddenly they wanted nothing more to do with Hagrid and Maxime. So in the end, none of the giants were convinced to come, but Hagrid still clings to a bit of hope that some of them might remember Dumbledore's message and come later. Spoiler alert, they don't. <laughs> So yeah, I really like this story. Some really cool world building as we learn more about the giants and their culture, and it's just cool hearing about Hagrid's adventures. I do understand why the movie didn't tell us all of it, though, and just gave us the important details. They needed to cut things for time, and it's just not that entertaining watching someone talk for so long. That works much better in a book than in a visual medium. That said, if they ever do remake Harry Potter as a TV series, I wouldn't mind actually seeing an entire flashback episode dedicated to this. So after Hagrid's story, Hermione asks him if he saw any sign of his mother among the giants. He says he asked some of the giants about her, and they told him she died years ago. He's not terribly upset about it, as she had left when he was about three, and he never really knew her. The trio then questioned him about his injuries and why he took so long to get back. He's fairly evasive and doesn't give a straight answer, and then they're suddenly interrupted by the arrival of the bitch in pink herself. Fortunately, the trio managed to hide under the invisibility cloak just in time. In the book, further emphasizing what a bitch she is, Umbridge is described as talking to Hagrid very slowly and loudly. Clearly, she assumes him to be unintelligent due to being half-giant. Umbridge questions him about the voices she heard earlier, the three sets of footprints in the snow leading to his cabin, and the cause of his injuries. Unfortunately, Hagrid has always been a pretty bad liar and comes up with the worst excuses, like that he was talking to Fang and that he got injured by tripping over a broomstick. Fortunately though, none of this changes the fact that the trio are completely invisible. She then questions him about where he's been, and this seems to be where the conversation in the movie picks up. I told you. I've been away from me health. Your health? Yeah. Bit of fresh air, you know. Oh, yes. As gamekeeper, fresh air must be difficult to come by. Before leaving, Umbridge informs Hagrid that she's been inspecting classes to weed out unsatisfactory teachers. When she's gone, the trio beg Hagrid to give them lessons about really boring creatures rather than anything dangerous so he can pass Umbridge's inspection. 
Unfortunately, they don't seem to have gotten through to him. The next day, Hagrid teaches the students about Thestrals in care of magical creatures, and it's actually a perfectly fine, non-dangerous lesson. As I mentioned, the movie replaced this scene with that earlier scene with Luna, which I think worked well. We do learn in the book here that Neville can also see the Thestrals as he saw his grandfather die, and one of the Slytherins, Theodore Knott, can also see them. Of course, Umbridge comes to inspect the lesson, and given her prejudice against part humans, as well as the fact that Hagrid is close with Dumbledore, she does everything she can to give Hagrid bad marks and make him out to be slow and dim-witted. She talks to him loudly and slowly, and uses hand and body gestures as if he can't understand English. She deliberately, and loudly, questions the Slytherins knowing they'll say bad things about him, and when she writes her criticisms of Hagrid on her clipboard, she mutters them out loud so everyone can hear. Has to resort to crude sign language. Ironic, considering she does exactly that while talking to him. Shows signs of pleasure at idea of violence. Again, pot, kettle, Dolores. Students are too intimidated to admit they are frightened. You know, if Voldemort promised to torture Umbridge if Harry was handed over to him, I just might consider it. One other thing worth noting here is that Hagrid's injuries from last night haven't healed at all. If anything, they may have gotten worse. This is a bit of a mystery throughout the book, and of course we learn the cause of it later. Hagrid's half-brother Grop has been doing it to him. Also, I hate to admit it, but on the way back to the castle, we actually get one of Malfoy's better burns. Yeah, Weasley, we were just wondering. Do you reckon if you saw someone snuff it, you'd be able to see the quaffle better? At the last DA meeting before Christmas break, Harry learned from Angelina that he, Fred, and George have been replaced on the Quidditch team. The twins have been replaced by Andrew Kirk and Jack Sloper, neither of whom apparently are very good. And Harry has been replaced by, of all people, Ginny Weasley. Apparently she's actually pretty good. The meeting itself goes well, as everyone, even Neville, has improved considerably. And at the end, after everyone else has left, we of course get the moment between Harry and Cho. Now, there is a subtle difference in the way this scene is presented in the movie compared to the book, but at least for me, it does change the way the scene feels. In the movie, Harry approaches Cho as she's looking sadly at a picture of Cedric. He's the one that initiates the conversation. Because of this, as well as Harry's tone, it comes across like a very genuine moment where Harry is trying to comfort her over her loss and sharing her grief, leading her to seek comfort in him. In other words, the scene feels much more romantic. In the book, Cho is the one who approaches Harry. Harry is just hoping to hear a Merry Christmas from her, but instead she's crying and asking about Cedric. This actually disheartens Harry, who doesn't want to talk about what happened in the graveyard, but still offers her words of comfort, despite now wanting nothing more than to leave. He seems more confused than anything when Cho kisses him. While I do like the uplifting feel of the movie version, the book version I think really emphasizes why their relationship isn't going to work, even if they don't realize it yet. They're both good people and they do like each other, but there's no, well, magic between them. Harry likes Cho for her looks as well as her just overall sweet and kind personality, but he doesn't have any sort of special connection with her. His feelings for her are more along the lines of a high school crush than actual love. Cho, for her part, is going through a lot of grief over losing Cedric, and while she does like Harry, I think at least right now, she sees him first and foremost as someone she can share her grief with. Unfortunately, the two of them have very different ways of dealing with their grief. Cho needs to talk it out with someone who understands, and if anyone can understand it's Harry, seeing as he saw Cedric die. Whereas Harry has the honestly much less healthy approach of not talking or thinking about it. Their needs just inherently clash. Neither are going to find what they're looking for in the other. So after the kiss, Harry returns to the common room where he tells Ron and Hermione about it, after Hermione figures it out, of course. Harry and Ron are confused about why she would be crying while kissing someone, and Hermione has to explain to them the complicated feelings going through Cho's mind. Obviously, she's feeling sad about Cedric, and therefore confused about liking Harry and guilty about kissing him. Conflicted because Umbridge is threatening to sack her mom from her job at the Ministry and frightened of failing her OWLs because she's so busy worrying about everything else. 
one person couldn't feel all that, they'd explode. Just because you've got the emotional range of a teaspoon. In the book, Hermione says that last line much more angrily. I honestly like how the movie turned it into a more lighthearted moment that makes them all laugh. So then we get the dream where Harry sees from Nagini's point of view as she attacks Arthur Weasley. In the book, this actually interrupts a more goofy, nonsensical dream he was having. Now obviously we don't know what's going on here yet, but as Snape explains to Harry later, this was Harry yet again seeing what Voldemort was seeing. Voldemort was supposedly possessing Nagini, so Harry saw from her point of view. Also, this is the point where Voldemort starts to notice the connection between them. Harry wakes up with his scar burning and tries to warn Ron about his dad being attacked, but Ron thinks Harry was just dreaming. Neville runs to get McGonagall, who thankfully believes Harry and takes him and Ron to Dumbledore's office. Harry tells Dumbledore everything he saw, and in both versions, Dumbledore, much to Harry's annoyance, is determinedly looking everywhere except at him, even when talking to him. In the dream, were you standing next to the victim? Or looking down at the scene? Neither. I, it was like I... He doesn't finish that sentence in the movie for some reason, but in the book, he explains that he saw everything from the point of view of the snake. Dumbledore sends two of the ex-headmasters, Everard and Dillys Derwent, to their other portraits in the Ministry and St. Mungo's Hospital, respectively. Everard tells people at the Ministry about Mr. Weasley's injury and they go down to get him, while Dillys confirms his arrival at St. Mungo's. In the book, Dumbledore then has Fox keep an eye out for Umbridge, and he also uses a strange device that shows a smoky snake, which splits into two when he asks, In essence, divided? It's never explained in the books what this actually does, but J.K. Rowling has confirmed that this was where Dumbledore figured out that Nagini was a horcrux. The fact that Harry was able to see so clearly through her eyes meant that a part of Voldemort's soul must be in her. Dumbledore sends McGonagall to get the other Weasleys, who are already there in the movie. Then he goes to the portrait of Phineas Nagellus Black and tells him to go to his portrait in Grimmauld Place to inform Sirius that Mr. Weasley has been injured and that his family and Harry are coming to stay. In the movie, Phineas wasn't really given any character, but in the book, we can see that he's really snobby, holds supremacist views, and has very little respect for Dumbledore. It takes the combined shouts of all the other portraits in the office just to make him stop pretending to be asleep. In the book, Dumbledore then receives a warning from Fox that Umbridge knows the students are out of bed. He sends McGonagall to head her off and uses a kettle he transformed into a port key to send the group to Grimmauld Place. Now, in the book, something happens here for a brief moment where the group are transported. Dumbledore looks into Harry's eyes for the first time that year, and when he does this, Harry is overcome by a wild urge to attack him. In the movie, it's a bit different. Harry, unable to take Dumbledore seemingly ignoring him any longer, yells, Look at me! Which I have to say was delivered very well by Daniel Radcliffe. And this is what causes Dumbledore to look at him. The feeling he has at this moment is never explained in the movie. He does start to mention it to Sirius, but it doesn't come out. Afterwards in Dumbledore's office, there was a moment when I... I wanted to... <sighs> I'm not sure why they didn't have him finish that thought. That's always kind of bothered me. Now, in the movie, we actually see Harry start his occlumency lessons with Snape here. In the book, this doesn't start until after the holiday, so I won't talk about it until then. Now, up until now, I'd say a good 95% of the cuts in this movie were justified, even if I do miss the content that was left out. However, there is a bunch of stuff that happens at this point in the book that I do think was a mistake to cut, including some visits to St. Mungo's Hospital, where we see quite a few interesting and amusing things. The movie just cuts right to Christmas, and Mr. Weasley is already better. Well, that was resolved quickly. The little Christmas party they had here was nice, though, as well as Mr. Weasley toasting Harry for saving him. Harry. 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 In the book, after they arrive at Grimmauld Place, they immediately find Creature, who calls them blood traitors and asks if it's true their father's dying. Sirius comes in and furiously shouts, Oh, to Creature. Now, this may seem insignificant right now, but it will in fact have huge consequences. 
You see, as we learn at the end of the book, Creature deliberately interpreted this order literally and used it as an excuse to leave the house. He then went to the only remaining black family member he had any respect for, Narcissa Malfoy. From this point on, he's secretly spying on the order for the Malfoys and will ultimately contribute to Sirius's death. I just love how Rowling plants these completely inconspicuous moments that are actually hugely significant. So anyway, the Weasleys, understandably, want to rush straight to St. Mungo's Hospital to see their dad, but Sirius refuses to allow them as it would look suspicious if his kids knew about his injury this soon. This results in a rather heated argument between Sirius and the twins who don't care what it looks like and just want to see their dad. Sirius tells them that their dad wouldn't want them to mess things up for the Order, that he knew what he was getting into and that he would consider what he was doing something worth dying for. Fred then hits below the belt, arguing that it's easy for Sirius to say this when he's stuck in this house, not able to risk his life. He does kind of have a point, but it doesn't make what Sirius is saying any less true. Sirius is still in the right here. Eventually, Mrs. Weasley arrives and tells them Mr. Weasley's going to be okay. She thanks Harry for warning them and Sirius for looking after the kids. During this time, however, Harry has been dwelling constantly on the fact that he was the snake in the dream, as well as the feeling he had of wanting to attack Dumbledore. He talks to Sirius about it, and this is another case where I think the movie greatly improved upon Sirius' character. In the book, Sirius mostly dismisses Harry's worries. I get that he's trying to make him put them out of his mind, but it feels very hollow and unhelpful. In the movie, Sirius actively tries to comfort Harry and cheer him up. I want you to listen to me very carefully, Harry. You're not a bad person. You're a very good person who bad things have happened to. You understand? Besides, the world isn't split into good people and death eaters. We've all got both light and dark inside of us. What matters is the part we choose to act on. That's who we really are. I love how the movie handled this part. In the book, Harry's state of depression lasts much longer. He wonders if Voldemort has been possessing him somehow and cuts himself off from the others and even tries hard not to sleep for fear that he might attack them. He starts to think he himself is the weapon Voldemort is after. He even considers running away for everyone else's safety, but is stalked by the portrait of Phineas Nagellus, who delivers a message from Dumbledore telling him to stay where he is. This pisses Harry off, and he starts ranting about how nobody is telling him anything. However, Phineas retaliates with some harsh, but in my opinion, very true words. You know, this is precisely why I loathed being a teacher. Young people are so infernally convinced that they're absolutely right about everything. Has it not occurred to you, my poor puffed-up Popinjay, that there might be an excellent reason why the headmaster of Hogwarts is not confiding every tiny detail of his plans to you? Have you never paused while feeling hard done by to note that following Dumbledore's orders has never yet led you into harm? No, no, like all young people, you are quite sure that you alone feel and think. You alone recognize danger. You alone are the only one clever enough to realize what the Dark Lord may be planning. Again, he's being a dick about it, but he's completely right. While Harry's feelings are somewhat understandable, he's also acting a little entitled here. That said, I also don't think Dumbledore's handling this perfectly either, but I'll get to that at the end. Eventually, after the gang, including Hermione, who has arrived by this point, force their company on him, Ginny is the one who finally manages to get through to Harry by reminding him that she's been possessed by Voldemort before, so she knows how it feels. She points out that since Harry can remember everything that's happened, that means he isn't being possessed, and Ron tells Harry he never left his bed that night. This finally snaps Harry out of his depression. It's also a moment that shows a real connection between Harry and Ginny, Taking this moment from Ginny is yet another case of the movies reducing her character. But on the other hand, I do love seeing Sirius be the one to have this moment in the movie, especially since this is the last movie we'll be seeing him in, so I'll accept it. What I cannot accept, however, is the movie's decision to completely cut St. Mungo's Hospital. There are definitely parts of it that could be cut or condensed, but to cut it entirely I think was a big mistake. 
In the book, Harry and the Weasleys visit the hospital a couple times to see Mr. Weasley. The first time, they're escorted by Moody and Tonks. They get in by talking to a mannequin in the window of a muggle store. Inside, we see several people with very bizarre symptoms, like a guy whose head clangs like a bell when he moves, a woman who issues steam from her mouth, a guy whose daughter has sprouted wings, and a guy whose shoes are trying to eat his feet. This is a wizard hospital, all right. <laughs> There's also this funny exchange when Harry asks about the healers. Are they doctors? Doctors? Those muggle nutters who cut people up? Nah, they're healers. They see Mr. Weasley in his ward and find he's quite cheerful and actually doing pretty well. He just can't move or he'll start bleeding. He mentions Willie Wittershins, who was responsible for the regurgitating toilets, and that he somehow got off on that charge. As I mentioned earlier, and as we later learn, the Ministry let him off in exchange for him spying for them. The twins question him about what he was doing when he was attacked and if he was guarding the weapon Voldemort was supposedly after, but he refuses to talk about it. When they persist, however, Mrs. Weasley orders them to leave the room, and they all do, leaving only Mr. and Mrs. Weasley, Moody, and Tonks in the ward. However, the ever-stubborn and curious students listen in with their extendable ears. They hear Moody theorize that the snake was sent by Voldemort as a lookout to see what he was up against, and that Harry might be being possessed by Voldemort. This is what really sets off Harry's paranoia about being possessed. The second visit is on Christmas, after Harry has gotten over his depression and knows he's not possessed. Hermione, who arrived between the visits, and Bill both come with them this time. On this trip, they're driven by Mundungus in a car he borrowed, and Moody and Lupin accompany them. When they visit Mr. Weasley, there's an amusing moment where they find that he had the trainee healer Augustus Pye have been experimenting with muggle remedies, namely, stitches. Mr. Weasley, with his love of muggles, was very excited about this, but unfortunately, they don't seem to have worked as the snake's venom dissolved them. Mrs. Weasley gets increasingly furious as he talks, and one by one, the other people there quickly make excuses to leave before she explodes. The trio and Ginny make their way towards the tea room, but are stopped on the fourth floor when they meet none other than Gilderoy Lockhart. Yep, Lockhart makes an appearance in this book. He still can't remember much of anything, but he seems to have gotten back his old self-absorbed personality as he constantly asks the trio and Ginny if they want autographs, despite them constantly saying they're not interested. He at least seems to remember that he's famous, even if he can't remember why. Ron seems to feel somewhat guilty about what happened to Lockhart. Harry, not so much. A healer arrives to fetch Lockhart, turns out he slipped out of his ward, and thinking the students are there to visit him, brings them along too. Now, in this ward, two interesting things happen. First of all, one of the other residents, Broderick Bode, has a plant delivered to him. At the moment, this doesn't seem interesting, but this plant will actually strangle him to death later. You see, as we later learn, Bode worked in the Department of Mysteries and was placed under the Imperious Curse by Lucius Malfoy to make him steal the prophecy. However, since only those to whom a prophecy refers can take one, he lost his mind when he tried, hence why he's in the hospital. The plant was sent to kill him before he recovered and spilled everything. The other thing that happens here, and this is a big one, is that the trio and Ginny encounter Neville and his grandmother, who were there visiting his parents. Harry already knows what happened to them, but this is where Ron, Hermione, and Ginny learn for the first time. There's a sad but also somewhat heartwarming moment where Neville's mom, very clearly out of it, goes up to Neville and gives him an empty candy wrapper. His grandmother suggests he toss it away, but he keeps it. Maybe there is a part of his mom that still remembers him. Meeting Neville's grandmother is pretty cool too. She comes across as stern, overbearing, and intimidating, even more so than McGonagall, but at the same time she has a very clear moral compass as she seems grateful to Hermione for helping her grandson in classes, is proud of her son and daughter-in-law for fighting against Voldemort, and believes Harry and Dumbledore about Voldemort's return. This sad encounter is then broken by the comedic touch of Lockhart impatiently demanding to know whether the students want autographs or not. The stuff with Neville's parents is the main reason I'm upset these parts were cut. Granted, he does tell Harry about them later in the movie, but actually seeing them in that state and him visiting them gives it a whole different feeling. Plus, it would have been so fun to see Lockhart again. I also just think it would have been cool to see how they designed the set of a wizard hospital.